and we're recording. Hey everyone, my name is Tyler Hudson. And I'm Nick Wilkes. And we are co-hosting this new podcast called The Tornado Podcast, um, talking about, you know, these violent rotating columns of air and everything that surrounds them. Um, today we'll be talking about the Rochelle, Illinois EF4 tornado uh, and why we think it should have been an EF5 rating as opposed to its high-end EF4. Um, but before we do that, um, we just kind of want to introduce ourselves a little more properly, um, just so you know who you're talking to or listening to. And I'm just going to throw it over to you, Nick, first. <laughs> I am a junior at California University of Pennsylvania. I am majoring in geographic information systems and emergency management and minoring in meteorology. I was a meteorology major, but switched majors um, last semester. And when I was two years old, I saw the Wizard of Oz and the tornado scene came on and I instantly became fascinated by tornadoes. Awesome. Okay, well, I am a Texas Tech graduate. I graduated in August of 2018 um, with a bachelor's in general studies with concentrations in atmospheric science and energy and English. Um, and I've taken a year off of school and plan on uh, going to grad school in spring of 2020. Um, going between either full, full on emergency management or uh, get a master's in geography with a concentration in natural hazards. Um, I'm still debating on the two. Uh, and how I got into tornadoes is um, stereotypically, I saw the movie Twister when I was two. Um, and I don't remember watching it for the first time, but I do remember being a very inquisitive child um, about tornadoes especially. Um, so my parents, after seeing Twister, bought me uh, National Geographic's uh, Nature's Fury, um, which was a documentary about uh, natural disasters, uh, and they heavily uh, mentioned tornadoes. Um, and I remember seeing video of the Heston, Kansas F5 tornado, March 13th, 1990, um, which is still a classic video. Um, and that just kind of solidified my love of tornadoes. And then uh, by the time I was four, um, I went to my first storm spotting class. Uh, and then by the time I was five, I was able to um, pinpoint storm or cell structure um, and uh, uh, tornado types. And the, it'd be, I'd be able to explain the Fujita scale in a, um, pretty coherent way for a five-year-old um and yeah i guess that's about it so um uh, i guess we want to go ahead and, and move into the rochelle okay, okay so, so just swap my information so the rochelle tornado happened on april 9th 2015 the Storm Protection Center did have, and I will share the graphic. They had the area, and can you see it? Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of things right now. There it is. Did have Northern Illinois in the 10% hatched area, which means um, significant tornadoes EF2 or higher are possible. And we ended up having 19 tornadoes that day. And most of them did occur in Illinois. Let me just pull that up. You can see the tornadoes that occurred in northern Illinois that day. Most of them were weak in the EF0 and EF1 range. But then we did have the one, which, which is 
known as the Rochelle tornado. It was the EF4, and unfortunately, it did kill two people and caused 11 injuries on its 30-mile track through the area. Real quick, um, the, the those EF zeros and EF ones were those satellites, or those were spawned from separate storms? Did you see that when we were looking uh, at yeah, the I know there was an EF zero near Esmond, south of Fairdale. That okay. was a satellite, and just as the main tornado was roping out near Irene, an EF one touched down. The other ones that tracked in from Illinois or from Iowa into Illinois were from a separate storm. Okay. Makes sense. Yes. I was just wondering because the tracks were so close together. Um, yeah. Now, all those tracks that you saw, let me pull that up again. These were all spawned by the same supercell that produced the Rochelle tornado. These tornadoes okay. up in this area. Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, what else is there? Um, guess we'll look real quick at the setup. It's pretty classic Illinois setup, I feel like. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, I do see that. Okay. So. And so bear with us because this is our first time doing something like this. So. <laughs> and we were having a lots of technical difficulties earlier. So we're just <laughs> yes. kind, of, kind of just trudging through this first one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we might better. be all over the place for this first one. So bear with us. So we had a upper level low coming in through the northern part of the state, um, flanked by a cold front and a warm front, uh, which the warm fronts are usually very classic Illinois tornado producers, and this was no exception for that. Um, there was a lot of low level shear um, near the boundary. Um, there were mid 60s dew points. Um, that were able to advect all the way up into northern Illinois. Um, and I think around, I think Rochelle is in this area, I think. And you can see that the dew points are in the mid to lower 60s, which is pretty good for Illinois um, to get all that moisture all the way up there. Um, and essentially with all the, the, um, the your moisture. Audio and, was cutting, your audio was cutting out. Can you repeat that? Was it? Yes. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. So basically, uh, this is a pretty classic setup for Illinois um, with a tornadic situation um, occurring up closer to the warm front. Um, so going back to us, uh, do we want to talk about damage? First, or do we want to look at videos and pictures? Uh, we can start tornadoes. off looking at pictures and videos of the tornado, and then we can discuss the damage. Okay. And so, the controversy of the damage. Right. Okay, so I do have this video of the tornado forming. Uh, it is by storm chaser Justin Gublon. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, See if I can get this a little bit bigger. Sorry, we're, we're getting through this, I promise. Okay. So. We haven't failed miserably yet, so we're, we're, we're on a good start. My computer likes to freeze, so bear with me. going very slowly. It does not like to share this video. We might not be able to share video using the software. Sorry. Maybe not. 
Can you see it better now, or is it still choppy? Still choppy. It's not as bad as it was. But I want to fast forward it so you can see. I don't know how it is on y'all's end, but um, there's a funnel condensing down to the ground. Um, and here in a minute, it's about to do some damage over in this area. But from the looks of it, it doesn't look like it's a particularly strong tornado. Um, the cloud base isn't really rotating that much. Um, so I guess something happened along its path to where it just exploded. Um, Your audio is cutting out again. Okay. No, we're I don't just know if it's a video. bandwidth issue or... Or maybe it's just a computer issue. Yeah. Because like I said, my computer sucks. Okay, so basically what well, all I was trying to show you guys was that the tornado when it first started was a particularly strong tornado. So um, I don't know if low level jet influenced it or maybe it hit a pocket of semi high Cape values. I don't know, but um, the intensity of that tornado just exploded out of nowhere it seemed like. so. Do you want to try, since I can't share stuff anymore, I guess, on my end, you seem to have a lot more luck with that. So I guess we can start looking at, at least show a picture of the tornado. Okay. So everyone knows what it looks like. And then we can uh, look at the damage. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay, I'll go into the National Weather Service website so that way we don't get a copyright strike mm -hmm. it's way down here so you can see here let's see if i can make the picture bigger nice stove pipe yes classic tornado type look that was near ashton and then you can see this photograph of the tornado as it was at peak intensity. Your friend Jody actually took this photo. Yes, she did. You just see that large, violent wedge right here. And that structure is just incredible, too. Should be able to. See all those striations from uh, the mid-level winds just cranking that that mesocyte clone. Oh, it would help if I hit the right button. <laughs> and then we have people another... unsubscribing as we speak. Probably. <laughs> yeah. And then you can see here another closer picture of the tornado near Hillcrest, Illinois. And just a, a wedge. Usually when you see a wedge like that, it's a violent tornado. Not always, but it's usually a pretty good indication that you're looking at a fairly significant tornado. Or that there's just a lot of moisture in there. Yeah, low cloud bases will make the tornadoes look wider. Which at some points, the mesocyclone was basic, or not the mesocyclone, but maybe the wall cloud was scraping the ground along yeah. with the tornado yeah, inside. That was that happened um during the Dodge City Tornado Fest in twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. The wall cloud the basically the entire wall cloud descended and you just had across the a fairly wide area just multiple vortices reaching the ground and mm -hmm. then lifting and then touching down. It seems to happen a lot with uh uh Dixie Alley tornadoes as well. Yeah. Just because, you know, you have those low LCLs with all that moisture. And, I mean, terrain up there can get pretty high because, you know, they have mountains and hills and stuff. So, I guess the clouds don't have to reach as far to tap into that moisture. So, okay. Um, what do you want to talk about next? Do we want to start talking about the damage and showing some of the damage pictures? Yeah, because I feel like 
um, we've amped long enough. Yes. <laughs> so, a little bit of um, how we got to to the podcast in general and why we picked Rochelle for the first one. So, uh, Brandon, I can't pronounce his last name. Molyneux. Okay, Molyneux. And Jed Nair, more from TornadoTalk.com, which we are partnering with our podcast. Mm -hmm. They created a Discord channel, which we will post in the down below for you guys to join mm -hmm. the Discord. We basically, where, there we go, about two weeks ago started this, and we did some, we were talking through the Dallas tornado as it was happening live when it was on the ground doing damage. But something that kept coming up was Rochelle was the F5. So we were talking about tornadoes that were underrated and Rochelle was something. When you just say the word Rochelle, it triggers Tyler. You just see it in his eyes. <laughs> I just have a lot of strong feelings. <laughs> yes. So a lot of the time whenever when you're on um, stormtrack.com or the other sites where people get on weather nerds like the two of us get on and just start talking about tornadoes and whatever the topic of tornadoes being underrated it typically goes to Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. or uh, the Valonia tornado of 2014 mm -hmm. Or the tornadoes of May 24th, 2011, near Oklahoma City. Yeah. A lot of the time, Rochelle doesn't get talked about in there. And even if you go and look at the, on Wikipedia, the list of F5 and EF5 tornadoes, all those other tornadoes that I just mentioned are on there as being listed as possible F5 tornadoes or EF5 tornadoes. Rochelle isn't. But there's, some fairly good arguments to make that Rochelle was an EF5. And before we really get into this, I feel like I need to make a disclaimer that we're in no way trying to um, downgrade or crap on the National Weather Service because they have a hard job to do and they know what they're doing 99.9% of the time. Um, and this is in no way trying to bash them at all because we know how, well, I assume we know how hard a damage survey can be. Um, you may have other influences and uh, just things that help you to keep more conservative ratings for whatever reason. But just know this is all in fun. We're not trying to uh discredit the national weather service so don't come for us we're just having fun here so with, with uh that being said uh i he says i get triggered by the word <laughs> rochelle just i just and i mean he, nick has pictures and stuff that he's going to show you of really intense damage and that's the reason why I get so upset is because no 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 the real reason I get upset <laughs> is the max wind speed yeah uh, yes you put yes. the max wind speed at 200 miles per hour are you telling me you cannot bump it to 201 to give it the EF5 rating <laughs> that just baffles my mind or was it 199 and they gave it 200 miles per hour. Was it 200? Was, yes. Okay. And something else with that, 18, 17 or 18 months before that, uh, November 17th, 2013, an EF4 tornado ripped through Washington, Illinois. And it was given a maximum wind speed of 190 miles per hour from the survey. Now, this is something... You can do your own research on this, and you can see just for yourself. It's fairly well known amongst the community. You can look for yourself online. That 
the National Weather Service toyed with an EF5 rating for Washington, however, backed off due to political reasons. And I'm not talking political reasons like Republican versus Democrat, just the politics of the of the field. Yeah, yes, yes. Um which is so I, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speculate on why they didn't, but politics did play a role into that. And it's fairly well known that from meteorologists in the Illinois area that don't work for the National Weather Service to talk about. Um, now, Washington, I th don't think Washington was an EF-5. They, they toyed with that. I think the EF-4 rating was great, 190 miles per hour, high-end EF-4. Mm -hmm. it, did, it did a lot of damage. Um, it killed more people, injured more people than uh, the Rochelle tornado. However, that's because it impacted a uh, an actual city, Rochelle. The Rochelle tornado didn't actually hit Rochelle proper. It moved just to the northwest and north of town, which is where mm -hmm. it did the most damage. And then it impacted the small town of Fairdale, where it produced borderline EF three to EF four damage as it went through Fairdale, and that kept down the death tolls and injury. As I mentioned earlier, two people were killed and eleven were injured, but. The Rochelle tornado was much more intense, and you can start pulling up those damage pictures from the damage surveys. And now, the wind speed given, uh, if you look at the, the the damage assessment toolkit on the National Weather from the National Weather Service, where they post the photos from damage surveys, the wind speed beside each of these photos was 200 miles per hour. So let me, was I sharing my desktop that entire time? No. Okay. No, we were looking at you. Okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> okay, so the first picture I'm going to pull up is just an aerial photograph. And are, are we seeing the photograph? Yeah, yeah, is you're it, good. Okay, okay, great. Let me try to zoom in on this. So I'll make it full screen for myself. Just look at that ground scouring. Look at okay. it. So let me do my my drawing here because it's an awesome feature. You can do some drawing, even add an arrow. So uh -huh. this house right here, that's definitely an EF4 house. This house right here got the these the roof torn off and exterior walls. The, those were EF two ish. I'd say that that house is probably F three. I can look on the dat, but just going off this picture mm -hmm. but then you see here you've got this house can you see my mouse yeah okay you got this house right here it's just the slab and the debris is strewn away from the house and then especially with this house over here and these two houses right here the wind rowing of the debris which happens in intense tornadoes from the multiple vortices. They just mm -hmm. screw the debris off well into the distance. Also over here around the railroad tracks, you can see some of these trees are just absolutely debarked. So these, see, see, though, look at all that ground scouring though. These two houses right here, I would say these are borderline EF4, maybe EF5. However, I'll show some more pictures that show definite EF5 damage in our opinions. But before you uh, get off that photo, um, that the house that you said was an EF5 or um, EF5? These two right here? No, just the, the southernmost one? This or one? The, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's also in the front right quadrant of the vortex so that's where the most intense winds are in tornadoes or in that front right uh, quadrant of them so if that says anything at all uh, yeah so what Tyler's talking about for those of you who don't know um, if say you have a tornado with 100 mile per hour winds and it's moving at 50 miles per hour if it's going the, the direction it's going to towards that area that it's impacting first, you would add that up and have 160 miles per hour. Or did I say 50? It doesn't matter. 
Okay, so it'd be 150 miles per hour, which is EF3, just for the sake of doing this. And then on the, the back side, opposite of the tornado motion, you'd have weaker wind speeds. So, is that what you're talking about, Tyler? Yeah, essentially. Okay. I was just thinking it's interesting because those other two houses were pretty leveled, um, but the other one looked more complete leveled. Yeah. So now let's get some, pull up some ground shots, which these are images I pulled directly from that, that aerial image was from the National Weather Service website uh, from mm -hmm. Rochelle, the actual survey. The rest of these images I pulled directly from the damage assessment toolkit. And they were the wind speed beside all of them were 200 miles per hour per the survey. Mm. So we'll start at where did I go? See, I have too many pictures pulled up, and so I don't see it. I'm sure you guys can see it right now. Do you, are you seeing that one picture of this of the foundation? Yeah. Okay, I am not because. I don't know what's going on right now. Okay, technical difficulties. Let me figure this out. <laughs> Story of your life. Right? Let's see. On that How, picture, then? Um, okay, I got it. I got it now. Let me just minimize the rest of these images I had pulled up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We're a mess. I'm a mess. It's like speak for yourself. <laughs> okay. uh, but this is a mess. So, but. Okay, so now I can see the picture too. So you can see and in the Wikipedia article, it actually, this house specifically talked about how there were well-bolted houses. And you can actually see here the anchor bolts yeah, I'm circling them. You can see the anchor bolts here on the foundation. This would be the porch right here, which is why we're not seeing anything. Mm. But yeah, you can see the anchor bolts all along here. Which is what keeps the house to the ground. And when you have a house like this, this is a well-built house. It, the anchor bolts look to be spaced properly. And it notes that on the Wikipedia article that they were bolted properly. But the reason this house did not get the F5 rating, which I can agree this house not getting the F5 rating, the shrubs, you can see just, they're fairly intact. So I can agree that this house got an EF4 rating. It was, and, and not for no, another reason, other than just the shrubs are still fairly intact. You can see it's a pile on the one end of the foundation. It's not actually swept clean off the foundation. Do we know if the tornado piled up the debris like that or if the rescue crews and um, people who were picking up debris did that. Do we know? That yeah, probably would have looked like this after the tornado. Uh, that's okay. just my thought. Um, because no, they sure did the survey. Right. They did the survey the next day, so they wouldn't be doing that stuff that soon. Gotcha. So there's that that image. You can stop sharing that, and let me close out of that one figure out what image I want to pull up next. Okay, so we'll pull up this, this image of this house. And now, Tyler, brace yourself. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'll just, before I even do any talking, I'll pull up the image and I'll let you, see, I'll let you speak your mind, Tyler. Is this one you haven't shown? Oh, my God. <laughs> I... This isn't one you've shown me. I don't, I have not shown you this photo yet. <laughs> so, what do you have to say about this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, oh my God, okay. Um, I only have one thing to say, okay. and that's EF5. Um, now I am gonna look at that. Out. Some we of that debris have, is granulated. We have anchor bolts. We do have the anchor bolts, and now obviously you can see the stuff that they were taking through and putting it back on the foundation. 
Yeah. But the, uh, you can see through here, we got two by fours here and there. A lot of them are broken, but right along here, the debris is just absolutely shredded and granulated. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. That's <sighs> that. And the ground looks a little bit scoured as well. Yes, the ground is it's not, I wouldn't say the ground scouring here is very severe compared to other no, no, pictures no. that I will be showing. And there's a lot of, of marks from the debris, but yeah, there is some some decent ground scouring around here. But yeah, that debris, the debris granulation. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. That's almost almost like um, Parkersburg. Parkersburg. Parkersburg is, that's going to be, uh, we're going to have yeah. to do another episode on that. The debris granulation from Parkersburg was absolutely incredible. Yeah, I know. It's insane. But that's another tornado for another podcast. Yes. Okay. So, uh, this next image is going to just be a close-up of the one house showing the anchor bolting. Mm -hmm. mm. And they also said that a so, lot of these houses that had the anchor bolts um, did not have the washers. They weren't given EFI ratings because the washers weren't there. Which what? What did we have there? I mean, there's a washer there, obviously. Yes, but it's kind of hard to see just because it's covered in mud because uh -huh. the ground was scoured, and it, you can see here a lot of corn and stuff. So that was probably left over in the fields from the past winter. But you could just see there's just mud caked on this thing, and the seal plate is still bolted down to the foundation. A lot of the times, they'll go EF4 as opposed to EF5 mm -hmm. because the seal plate was not bolted to the foundation and it just simply slid off. This, you can see the anchor bolted right there. It's, it's not straight nailed like a lot of them are. This, I, you can see nails in there, but the, the, this was actually bolted to the foundation. You can see the, just the debris in the basement's just caked in mud and other stuff too. <sighs> okay, so there's that picture, Tyler. I'm triggered again. Okay. Um, so. I was thinking earlier or before, because I'm this is the first time I'm seeing some of these photos as well. Um, what are we looking at here? Okay, so this is <sighs> ground scouring. Yeah, now this. The house isn't actually completely swept away, so I can't really go EF5 code if it was really well built. It yeah. wasn't swept away. But you can just see here the shrubs. You can see that right there. That shrub's just completely stripped. And just the debris granulation and ground scouring in this picture is pretty pretty decent. Well, now, the trees aren't really debarked. And even this this one in the foreground right here, you can see it still has most of its twigs. So th this was prob this was EF four in this area. And actually, this house on the DAT had 170 mile per hour rating. I don't know if I necessarily agree 170 miles per hour. That might be a little too low, just based on some of the contextual evidence. Sure. But that contextual evidence also would negate the EF five rating for this particular area yeah no i i wouldn't consider this ef5 either um by the look of the trees and that there's still a giant pile of debris on the slab yeah. um yeah i i i agree um i don't like i don't think it had ef5 strength a ton of time um i don't think most ef5 tornadoes do other than Halkelberg, but once again, that's another for another podcast. Another <laughs> um, we could have a whole podcast on the EF five tornadoes from the super outbreak. If you guys would be interested in that, let us know in the Discord. Yeah, totally. We will link below. Join our Discord. It's the Tornado Talk Discord, but we do have a section for the podcast. Let us know if you want to hear about that, because there, 
was at least one of the tornadoes that was rated EF4 that I showed Tyler the picture and he cringed when he saw it because that was just complete annihilation of the neighborhood. So. Which one was that? The Ringgold, Georgia tornado. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, right. it was just slab after slab and there's yeah. just no debris, no work, so. Yeah. I, I, I feel like we, we should probably have um, one about. There will be a lot to talk about on that one, that's yes. for sure. So. But for, the next image I'm okay. going to pull up. The smart car. Yes, the smart car. I think this, other than the slabs, this is like, this is like a complete destruction all around. I just like, wish, instead of focusing on the car, they would have had more of what was going on around it, which, I mean, we can clearly see what's going on around the car in this picture. But this was probably where the tornado was at peak intensity. You can just see that there's no grass left. It's just mud. It, it ripped the grass right out of the ground. And you can see the debris that's strewn through this debris field. Yeah. It's just little bits and pieces. And the smart car actually surprisingly fared a lot better than – typical cars do and yeah five tornadoes and i think that has to do with the design just how small it is i mean it's still the front was completely shorn off of it and just see it cake the mud but i think that has more to do with the design of the car than it, the intensity of the tornado could, i don't think you could have survived if you were in that car yeah, absolutely not like the, the roof is fine and there's no telling how many times it tumbled yeah but just the, the ground scouring in this image is just intense and just yeah. the debris that's strewn through the area you can see there's debarked tree limbs and there's some type of down here there, maybe that's a, a jacket or something some type of fabric but just the do two by the, fours are just toothpicks do you see those set of wheels in the upper left yeah right yeah right here what do you think that is i don't know maybe that's from a wagon or something maybe I don't know, but yeah, there's, there's just a way looking at that, going, hmm. or maybe like, um, oh, what are those um cars that you get for little kids that they can drive around in? Oh yeah, those the, uh, the power wheels is that what they're called? I think so. Yeah, maybe it's one of those or a wagon, but yeah, this is this image right here. Forget about the houses that were the well built, the well anchored houses that were swept away in the F5 fashion. This image right here is what did it for me. This image was posted on, it was um, a forum on talkweather.com about, that was called Significant Tornado Events, and it basically divulged into talking about tornadoes that should have been rated F5 or EF5. It was just a gold mine of information, so many photos. Unfortunately, um, it got taken down. Don't know why. There is a new thread on Talkweather, but the original thread from 2013 is missing. 2014? 13. We started in 2013. Oh. And then it kept growing up until 2017. And then in 2017, it just dis disappeared. That's weird. But when this image was posted on there, this is what did it for me to, to validate that Rochelle was in the F5. It was this image right here. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely is a good, um, some good evidence. But that the, Look at the, ground, the ground scouring in this picture compared to the aerial image near those houses. Yeah. There was yeah. there was ground scouring there, but not to this magnitude. There's there's no, no grass at all. It's just pulled the grass right out of the ground. Right. And then you can see back here, can't tell if the trees are debarked or not. There were trees were debarked. But actually this one behind you where you are, Tyler, your little yeah. head is floating. I actually did not see this the upper right image because that's where your face was. <laughs> it <laughs> that tree looks to be debarked, but they're just just not, just point. yeah. Even those in the top right, those looked pretty pretty. Yeah. Um, so this is devastated. probably where the tornado reached peak intensity. I agree with that. Do we know so, where that smart car was? Was that near Fairdale? I don't know. 
I feel it. Um, Let me go back. Uh, because that image was not in the damage assessment toolkit, so I don't. It was just on the National Web Service website. So Let me see if it says anything on here about it. I feel like that was probably a little bit closer to. It just says it was north of Rochelle. So if I go on here to the damage assessment toolkit, I feel like I might be able to identify where it was because there was. There were only two areas of where the National Weather Service deemed EF4 damage, which I can actually show you here on the on the damage assessment toolkit. Now, this isn't just for the April 9th, 2015. I just have it selected to all, so you mm -hmm. might see another tornado that doesn't actually belong. So let me screen share. Okay, you able to see this? Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can see right here is Rochelle. The tornado passed just to the northwest of Rochelle. If it would have went through Rochelle, it, it, the, the amount of deaths and injuries, God only knows, but it, it would not have been good. So right here, this, this neighborhood was where that aerial image was taken, and then that, let's see if I can actually find that house I showed you earlier. Is this? Okay, so yes. So these images that we were looking at earlier were taken here or along South Richardson Road, it looks like, just northwest of town. But then the tornado continued a week and a bit to EF2, as you can see here, unroofing some of these houses. Mm -hmm. And then it hit, it, this is probably where it reached its peak intensity was in this area. And when it says north of Rochelle, this is the area that was north of Rochelle where it reached EF4, or we think it reached EF5 intensity again. Right here, this was the restaurant. Um, was right here. I've, I know this was shown on the national news because there were people inside the restaurant when it got hit. Mm -hmm. by the tornado so yeah this would have been the area that we saw let me change it you might be able to see exactly where that smart car landed so that smart car probably that image was taken in the in this area right here just based on the trees and everything so it would have either had to come from the parking lot of that restaurant or one of these houses that were well bolted to their foundation and swept away. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I would agree with that assessment. So that is just me putting on my my thinking cap and making some assumptions just based on how it looks on the aerial imagery because that's the last area of EF four five damage. This is one of the satellite tornadoes actually, Tyler, right here. You can see that you asked about earlier. And then right here is Fairdale, where you can see all the damage of Fairdale. The peak, the peak intensity was EF3. So let's see, let's pause on the images here. So do you have anything mm -hmm. to say about this? I'd say EF3 seems applicable. The tree really isn't looking too impressive here. And Yeah, I, I, would, I would say it was probably high-end EF3. Maybe, maybe lower did F4. Yeah, so that, that house particularly, it was given 160 miles per hour. So yeah, yeah so that's, that's up around EF3. Yeah, that's pretty close to EF4 so, level. So here's a close-up of foundation from one of the houses. Yeah, now here, this is one. This house is not properly anchored to the foundation. It's just the no. cinder block foundation, and there's absolutely no, no bolting at all. So, So these are some of the things that, that go into ratings for tornadoes is how well was it anchored to the foundation, but also look at the, look at the grass around the foundation. It's not scoured no. and there's not debris granulation. So again, that helps. Let me close out of some of these pictures. I mean, there's some small bits of debris, but I feel like they were yeah, this is a, with. So 160, 165 miles per hour, high end EF3. Yeah. 
that seems that seems pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I wouldn't even go EF four just because the ground just is too intact. So look, you see, we can argue for other reasons that it's not just why it should be rated EF five. We can go through and point out and just we're not biased about it is what I'm trying to get at. We're just trying to point out why we think the tornado was underrated. And once again, I mean, we're, it's not like we were there with them during the right. during the damage assessment, but just from what we see and what we've looked at, um, and, it seems pretty obvious to me. But like, and to talk about like the conservative ratings, like we talked about, um, you you brought that. I know Tyler you brought that up about how sometimes they, they like be conservative. When I go through and I do my research for my tornado database that I've been working on, looking through the newspapers, I I know the one off the top of my head was in unreport unofficial is what I should say. Tornadoes appear in any official database, nineteen fifty seven near Waterfall, Pennsylvania in Fulton County. It probably was an F two, but just I wasn't there, and I, there's no pictures of it, but based on the newspaper, I decided to just err on the side of caution, be conservative, and give it an EF1 rating. Well, F1, because it's 1957. Right. So, so I can understand trying to be conservative and not want to go, oh, yeah, there's a, a slab, EF5. But the contextual evidence supports an EF5 rating. And, and also just the fact <laughs> that they went 200 miles per hour. That still baffles me. It really does. Like, if you're not going to give it an EF5 rating, don't give it a 200 mile per hour wind speed. Just don't do it. You know? Like, and that's the thing, the, that's, that like, is the upper portion of EF4 is 200 miles per hour, but there's no difference between 200 and 200 miles per hour. Let's just be honest here. Right. Other than. Um, we like to put things in categories, which is all it is. And that's what, and some people, they, they're like, why even rate tornadoes in the first place? Because we like, we like to categorize things. But I also think it's really important to have a, a, uh, a database that is accurate. Yes, because and consistent. Climate, climate, wow, words. <laughs> Climatologically speaking, yes. it's important to know if tornadoes in a certain area are either gaining strength or if they're on par with past seasons like there's a lot that people can look at when you have this database of and it also comes down to building houses if you're building an area that's prone yeah. to these violent tornadoes you want to make sure your house you're putting the extra money in whether it's a a tornado totally. shelter or you're spending the extra upgrades on hurricane windows, hurricane clips for the roof, stuff like that. Because you can build, to an extent, a tornado-proof house. I say that in quotes because, obviously, you're not going to survive an EF5 tornado if you have, a, like, the hurricane clips that are rated 140 miles per hour. But the chances of you encountering an EF4 or EF5 tornado are rare. Even if the tornado at its peak was EF4 or EF5, that accounts for, on average, between 1% and 5% of the damage path, unless you talk about something like Hackleberg, which is right. a whole other story. Yeah. So you can build to resist the winds in a way to a certain extent, and knowing what, what has been in the area before, can help you prepare for the future exactly and just because you didn't have one before doesn't mean you're not going to have one in the future and, and i also want to say it's not like we want these to be ef5 tornadoes i mean nobody wants to wants to see a tornado slide a house i mean i don't want that i don't think nick wants that but the the fact of the matter is wow well, words again the fact of the matter is is that they happen regardless and I think we need to accurately 
document them because like I said, like we were just talking about, it's important to have a accurate database of tornado climatology. And, and consistency. Yeah. If you're going to go around rating EF4 tornadoes, 170 mile per hour winds, for example, with Ringgold, it was damage was more severe than this. The way there was just nothing left near the foundations at all. It, it probably was more severe than Rochelle, but it was given a low end EF4 rating with 170 miles per hour. There's so many inconsistencies. And when you are trying to work, whether it's a research project or your own project, like I do, just trying to accurately have a tornado database just because there are so many inaccuracies, it, these little things like this matter. Maybe not to the public, but for us scientists, for us doing research, for running statistics, all that stuff, it matters. <laughs> I was about to say something, but I can't say it. Um, what were you going to say? Just say it. No, I really can't say it. Say it in the chat. <laughs> I'm curious yeah, now. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it in the chat. I'll but, see, I'll see if, it, if it can be said. I wouldn't risk it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave, leave it at that. Um, This is the juicy stuff now. <laughs> and like Tyler said, I don't we're, know not, gonna... we're not trying to talk down on the National Weather Service or act like we're better. Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. Okay. Okay. We're I'm not gonna, going just, there. Just gonna... Sorry to tease you guys, but... <laughs> I'm not saying it. If you guys are curious as to what Tyler said, you can message him on Twitter. <laughs> you can. I won't tell you, but you can. If you... <laughs> um, what was I saying? You're saying how we're not trying to talk down on the national. Oh, yeah. We're not trying to diminish the weather service or act like we know more. Or... I mean, because obviously now that like one of us got degrees in meteorology, so... This is all, or even we don't have degrees in structure, structural engineering either. So, um, no, but whenever, whenever you spend most of your free time looking into stuff like this, mm -hmm. you tend to know how to apply, uh, apply it. And also, I don't know if you can still do it and probably can't because now I have a MacBook. And I know a lot of stuff National Weather Service uses. For example, um, they use ArcGIS, which is something I use being a GIS major. I can't use it on my own laptop because I have a Mac. But mm -hmm. I remember this probably would have been about 10 years ago. It was called the Fujita Scale Training Kit. It was downloadable straight from the National Weather Service or SPC website. I'm not exactly sure. It was the exact same thing that the National Weather Service um, people go through training to use the enhanced Vegeta scale and it was available to the public and I, I did it just because this is stuff I'm fascinated by I did not so, know that yeah I wish I knew that when I had GIS on my laptop yeah look it up and see you might be, you might need flash or something I don't know you, you have a Windows computer so I'm sure it'll work for you that's what just for me I know a lot of the stuff like that I can't do just because I have the problem is I don't, I don't have GIS on my laptop anymore. yeah you don't need you don't need ArcGIS to do it I was just oh. saying just because I have a Mac I can't do a lot of stuff like oh, that I see and a lot of the stuff in National Weather Service posts do like for example the damage assessment toolkit is on ArcGIS online and so it doesn't run as well on my Mac as it does on a Windows computer mm -hmm. so if the EF kit is still available, we will definitely link that down below. And that could be something if you want to fool around with, you can. Yeah, for sure. But I know Tyler, I'm sure if it's still available, you're going to do that. Probably. It does talk about, were you talking about Palom, Nebraska the other day? Because that's one of the tornadoes I that wasn't, you take I, survey on there. Yeah, someone was talking about it. It wasn't me, though. Okay, maybe it was... Um, Wyoming. Someone was saying the Howland, Nebraska tornado was more um, violent than the El Reno tornado. Oh, yes. Oh, that, that right there would be a good episode. Talk about El Reno. 
So I, I have a feeling we're on opposing sides for El Reno. El Reno was not an EF five, in my opinion. I don't. I agree. Oh, okay, okay. So we're not. No, we're not sides. opposing sides with that. But people are going to come for us now. I know. Because <laughs> now they're going to be like these people think a Rochelle was an EF five and not El Reno. Well, yeah. I'll tell you, hey, El Reno did the same. Rochelle damage. produced. And much more intense damage than El Reno did. I was about to say, if El Reno would have done damage like Rochelle, I would be more inclined to agree with you. Because, once again, we're going to have to remind people that the Vegeta skill, or the Enhanced Vegeta skill, is a damage-based skill. It's not yes. wind speed. Yes. So, if you're going to classify El Reno and EF5 based on mobile radar data, what, which wasn't even ground-based. No. That was up in some upper levels. I think levels the, highest, of the highest ground, closest to the ground, was around 200, give or take. Because yeah. I know one of the suction vortices had... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was one of the suction vortices was moving at 188 miles per hour. That's what I was okay. thinking of. That was the one that hit um, Tim Samaris's vehicle. Okay. That yeah. was moving at 188 miles per hour. Oh. Yeah. Right. That, that's what I was thinking of. That's where I was going with that. So, just... just. But, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think El Reno was an EF5 at all. Um, there was no, no ground scouring, no obliteration of buildings. No, and the fact that it was slow moving, that's what... And, we're going down a rat hole that maybe we should just end right now and discuss in another podcast, but oh, let's just finish it up right here since we did bring it up. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say about the Gerald tornado of 1997 wasn't F5 just because it sat there and moved slowly. The Arena tornado moved pretty slowly too, and you did not see the level of damage that Gerald produced. You did not see the level of damage Rochelle produced. You yeah. didn't see the level of damage the 2011 El Reno tornado produced, which that was a monster. That thing toppled a two million pound oil jack through and, right over i-40 yeah that that El Reno tornado was very intense and definitely an ef5 oh yeah but no, it gets it no, gets no. overshadowed um due to El Reno, and i don't want to diminish the 2013 El Reno, but i think a lot of the reason that it has this big i don't know how i want to word this I, not necessarily hype around it, but I, you know what I'm trying to yes, reputation. It killed very well respected, very safe. They were they were very safe storm chasers. They didn't do things that were reckless. It, it I think that's why it has the reputation it does, and why. And maybe that's an an unpopular opinion that I have, but. But also, I, think that's, I mean. Structurally, I think it's a pretty unique tornado itself. Um, yeah, oh, it was. That was when we were talking as about as it did, and moving in as an erratic damage path as it had. I don't want to diminish, like I like I totally agree with you. I don't want to diminish the event itself, but I don't I don't like that it overshadows. The 2011 tornado so much. Even the tornado that hit El Reno this past June or July, it was rated EF3. Mm -hmm. did, the, did you see the damage it did? I mean, it hit a trailer park in a hotel. The damage it did was more severe than the actual damage the 2013 El Reno did. Yeah. I mean, because homes were destroyed in EF low-end EF3 fashion with this thing. And I know there was some um, a 180-foot wind turbine tower that was picked up and thrown in front of one agricultural center. But it just was not EF5. And it was 2.6 miles wide. It was the widest tornado. But even in Pennsylvania, 1985, May 31st, there was an F4. Probably would have been an F5 if it hit more five-lane areas. It went through along a 70-mile path instead of a 60-mile path. It had different turns and weird movements to it. It went over mountains and rivers. It was two and a half miles wide. It, the forest was obliterated. Trees were snapped, uprooted, debarked. Homes were swept away. It only hit 10 homes. They were all at the beginning of the path. And then it was just through the, the wilderness of the Michigan State Forest. And it just obliterated the forest. That, that was more intense than El Reno in all aspects. It was almost as wide. 
it had a path length that was so much longer. And the but the damage it did was more intense. Probably need to save the rest of that tangent for yes. Because you know, this would be a great thing just talking talk, talking about this. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um. Hey, I just yeah. love stirring the pot. That's all I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> How long have we been on? About an hour. We have been going on. I don't know. Does well, tell say? me how long I've been recording. Do you know what time we started? It's 7.20. Because I know we started, and then we stopped, like, how many times? Because we kept messing up. Three times, I think. So, I think, been... I think I think we're getting close to an hour if we haven't exceeded it already. I so think we're I over think... an hour now. Okay, we might be. So, it's, it's time to go. And... Any final closing words? Arena was in the, not Arena. Fuck, I messed up. Rochelle was in the F5. Man, you took my words. Okay, I'll say Rochelle was not in the F4. There you go. All right. All right well, well, what were you saying? Gonna, we're just going to keep saying the same thing, I guess. <laughs> At the same time. God, this is a nightmare. This was our first podcast, if you can't tell, so Why? we'll get better Comment. as time goes right. on. And if you have any comments, concerns, constructive criticism, um, anything like that, let us I'm know. Sure there will be lots our, of criticism. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not hate on us because we, we shared some unpopular opinions, that's fine too. But um, you can reach out to us on Twitter at tornado underscore podcast our personal twitters um we have the discord which will be linked below for the tornado talk which we are proud to be part of the tornado talk community such a good team yes if you are tornado nerds like us and you don't know what tornado talk is you're missing out on an awesome website um Maybe I'm biased just because I do have some funnel features on there where I've talked about <laughs> uh, the I 1985 awesome. tornado outbreak, which, by the way, this thing behind me, that was Pennsylvania's only F5 tornado on record. It happened in 1985, and that outbreak I wrote about it. I've also written about uh, the 1949 Pennsylvania tornado outbreak and the 1986 Virginia tornadoes. So... And there's many more funnel features for me coming on there. So maybe I am biased when I say it's a cool website just because I've done stuff for them, but it's a great website. Jen puts a lot of work into it. Jen's pretty awesome. She, Jen is awesome. Okay. With that being so. said, I guess we're going to go ahead and close out. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this little rant. Um, and hopefully next time it'll go a little bit smoother. A little bit better, hopefully. <laughs> um, fingers crossed. <laughs> so until next time, I am Tyler. And I'm Nick. And we are the hosts of the Tornado Podcast. And we will see you next time. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs>